Welcome back to E75. This is Lecture 8, JavaScript Continued. So among our goals today are to pick up where we left off last week, introduce a bit more about JavaScript, and also to pave the road toward next week and the week after, where we'll be looking at AJAX, Asynchronous JavaScript and XML, although we mentioned last time that there are yet more variants on the XML ideas. We'll see over the coming weeks. And we'll also be introducing Project 3, Google Mashup tonight. You'll notice there are no handouts because they were not yet ready on the printer, but we'll hopefully have them within half an hour. So uh, consider that a bit of suspense. So a couple of announcements. One on the course's website, um, you will find that various classmates have really exploited various um, holes or features in the course's big board. Um, in fairness, these have existed for uh, semesters, but rather than plug these holes, uh, it seems to be more fun to just kind of uh, make fun of them uh, after the fact. So we do generally disallow after hours trading, which is something that folks sometimes exploit. We did disable that a couple days ago um, so that folks, especially those of you tuning in from home from other time zones, wouldn't sort of be SOL if you sit down at a very reasonable time to do your work, but the US stock market it's just not open to you. Uh, so we disabled that. But it does look like Carl pulled ahead of Rob here uh, really at the last minute. Both of them did in a ridiculous percentage gain, 4,000% up for Carl and 3,000 for Rob. Um, you'll find that our quotes, again, are not necessarily real time. So if you have like an E-Trade account or Scottrade, I mean, you can literally open that in one window and then you know, do really well 15 minutes in the past <laughs> by buying and selling. So yeah. Wow, so that's that's you should you should should have bought 15 minutes ago then, right? When you see things like that. Oh, so you missed out. I think I did see your post uh, later today. So we'll likely pull this down at some point. It was really meant to be fun and also just give you um, an example of how you might implement the project to see the various UI uh, capabilities. But what you'll also notice per Project 3 spec, which we'll have later tonight and is already online, we also have a sample implementation of Project 3. So the teaser for this, as promised, is that you'll be implementing a Google mashup that mashes together news feeds in RSS format from Google News and maps from Google Maps whereby you'll implement something similar to this. And the goal of our presenting a sample implementation is not to say, go implement precisely this. You'll see in the spec that there's simply fe various features that are expected and technical requirements. But this is one possible implementation thereof. And you'll see we are, in fact, by default, centered on Cambridge with that little blue dot. Uh, if I go ahead, though, and click any of these red markers, we'll see current news articles related to, in this case, Cambridge Mass, 02138. And these were pulled from Google News' RSS feed. Uh, if I close this particular info window and click on this marker, you'll see that another town that's currently within view is Somerville. So we have some news being pulled dynamically there. But what the goal of the project is going to be is not to support news in the local area, but any area. So I happen to be very familiar from childhood with uh, only a couple of zip codes, one of which is 9021. Which is the one I also often register for various accounts with. Um, hit enter. This is going to whisk me away to the Beverly Hills area. And after that progress bar stops spinning, I'll see another four, five or fewer markers for local towns here. Let me go ahead and click on this marker right on Beverly Hills. And I will, in fact, see some current events related to Beverly Hills. So this is the spirit of the mashup, whereby you will have to provide the user with the capability of searching at least the United States, um, either by way of zip codes or by way of city-state strings, whereby they'll then be whisked away to that location. You will then figure out what they are looking at between the latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates in the top left and the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Then you're going to do some kind of query to figure out what are the largest cities in this roughly rectangular region. Then go ahead and fetch news for those five or fewer cities and drop a marker right on uh, whatever coordinates are appropriate for that town, such that when clicked, you get this little cartoon bubble and can see some news related to that area. And you'll see that these are, in fact, actual news articles. As the links imply, this will whisk us away to this week in Hollywood land, for instance. So. Anyhow, um, that's the teaser. And it will work for your zip code, if uh, any one zip code, so long as it's supported by Google News and Google Maps. So any questions on this teaser? What's the legal status of uh, piggybacking on Google and Yahoo's applications like this? 
It's a good question. Um, the uh, legality, the permissions with which you can use this kind of data. So Google Maps makes this very possible, and it's very much encouraged by way of their API, which we'll begin to look at tonight. Google News does have some restrictions, particularly because they don't want you to become a repository for it. We've been using it only for um, academic purposes here. And so we actually, behind the scenes, cache some of those news articles. Because what you'll find is that with 160 or so students in the course, all of whom are working on this, say the Sunday night before it's due, we start hitting Google News a lot. And all of those requests you'll see come from our server, which generally isn't a good thing. And so unbeknownst to you, quote unquote, we'll actually be caching news articles for up to 24 hours. Hours. So if you notice anything a little less than current, just realize it's probably because we're trying to minimize the number of hits on their server, which they too want to discourage. Um, but in short, it depends on the various services. So Google Maps, absolutely encouraged. And that's how I was able to make last week that Google mashup of Harvard's own campus. Google News itself does not have an official API, just these RSS feeds. So read the fine print is the short answer. Other questions? So you might be wondering, ah, that's pretty neat. We now have access to full source code with projects like this. Well, not quite. So one of the topics we'll glance at tonight is this reality. I'm pulling up Firebug, which is this wonderfully recommended tool for uh, certainly this last project. I'm going to go ahead and pull up, uh, which is the file I actually want to pull up. You know what? I think it's actually is it scrolling off of my screen here. Let me go ahead and click News, Map, Min. Come on. Wow, that's an interesting bug in um, Firebug. If your window is not large enough to see, uh, you can't actually select that file. So lower in this list is a link to a file called mapmin.js, which is the minified version of our source code. And just to um, one sort of diffuse a sudden interest, mapmin.js, this is our implementation of this particular mashup. Whoops, uh, news map, oh, uh, mashup min, there. So this is the JavaScript code that um, implements collectively this particular website. And just to give you a better sense of how much code there is or what it looks like, let me turn on word wrap mode here. So this is what's called minified JavaScript. I don't know why the world didn't call it minimized JavaScript, but we simply ran it through a, few, a free tool called Yahoo uh, YUI's compressor. And the purpose of this tool is to take source code that has long function names, nicely named variable names, nice and comments, good code, um, and compress it not in the um, binary sense, but in the white space sense, in a stylistic sense, so that your code after run through this tool uses as few bytes as possible to get the job done. So variable names, if they were long and descriptive, all of a sudden, thanks to this call, become A and B and C and very short abbreviations. All white space was stripped out of this code. And this was all code that I did, in fact, write. And I, I promise you it looks better um, if you view the original version. But there's motivations for running it through a compressor like Yui's here and then publishing this on your website. What, among, uh, what are some of the motivations, would you say? So performance, right? it's just a complete waste of bytes to provide a browser and thus an internet connection with superfluous white space, long variable names, because the computer certainly doesn't need that. Other motivations? Yeah. Yeah, so partial obfuscation. There's this principle in, in computer science that says you should not try to seek security through obscurity just by making your stuff look complicated or keeping a secret from the world. So this is really just obscurity that we're using to make it harder for someone to say, go out there on the internet and copy our implementation of CS75's mashup. Um, but certainly someone with a fine tooth comb could go through this and figure out how it's working. And frankly, this is why we have that, that clause at the top saying that uh, pedagogically or academically, one in this class should not be trying to reverse engineer this code. It is obfuscated for a reason. But I pull it up here just to demonstrate what these tools can do. And it's actually a good thing for those two reasons. One, performance, because it's a complete waste of bytes not to do something like this on your code. And two, kind of, sort of, for intellectual property reasons. So you, you or your manager is a naive person if you think that you can protect your code if implemented in any client-side language, like JavaScript, from prying eyes or someone copying your code. But you can at least raise the bar. And you can at least make it probably more time consuming to figure out how the other guy's implementation is working than for him or her to just go implement their own. And that's typically what's done. And if you look at a lot of popular websites, whether it's Facebook or Google, a lot of the minification is just done really for performance, because those bytes do, in fact, add up. So 
And that's a little teaser there. Um, and certainly, uh, it's expected that one in the class implements his or her own implementation. But that's what's going on underneath the hood. And what you'll see is that this project is actually has two parts. So if we think through the goal of this project, it's got to be the following. So we clearly have a mapping rendered by default. So there's some kind of trickery going on that tells Google, show me the map around Cambridge, or whatever coordinates you ultimately decide to use. There's a search box up top. There's some kind of form. When I click Submit, though, it's not that the whole page is reloading. If I go back to 90210 and click Go, notice the URL doesn't change. So data gets submitted, but apparently behind the scenes. And that'll be the topic for the next two weeks of Ajax. But what we have done is refresh what's inside of this div that's nested inside of the web page here. So what information was being queried? Or where did that query go, do you think, when I typed in 90210? So maybe to Google. Or maybe even to our own server. And in fact, for simplicity, what we do is you don't, you, you'll find in the spec, you won't have to support arbitrary city state values. Though you could do so because Google itself offer, offers what's generally called a geocoding service, where you can pass it a fairly freeform string and it will do its best to figure out what geographic location you were getting at and then return to you some nicely tagged information like the formal name of that city, state, the zip code, maybe the lat long coordinates. We only expect for this project that a user type in a legitimate zip code because what you'll be getting as part of this assignment is a really large CSV file. So we decided that we wanted to be able to map zip codes to news and vice versa because Google News you'll see is RSS feeds support inputs by way of zip codes, not arbitrary city-state values, but zip codes in particular. So we will be giving you a large CSV file with 42 or so thousand rows in it. And every one of those rows has a city's name, a state. Uh, it's got its zip code. And it's also got a representative latitude, longitude point that kind of represents the center of that city. And it will also ultimately allow you to figure out what cities, as a result, are in view of the maps viewport here. So what's really going on behind the scenes, especially if I go ahead and use one of my favorite tools here, live HTTP headers, and I this time search for 02138, enter. The query that goes across the wire is a whole bunch, but the very first one, uh, let's see, or rather the second one in this case, is apparently going to this URL. So I appear to have implemented a file called cities.php. So I'm using sort of my PHP background here. I appear to be passing in what would you infer from this get string? Yeah, so I'm passing in some GPS coordinates. Looks like southwest, a southwest corner, and then later a northeast. So I went with these two coordinates here and gave them a latitude and a longitudinal point. And that appears to be it, because what I've essentially passed to this file called cities.php are the top coordinates of this rectangle. And I could have done this, I could have done this. Can't really do this or this, right? You have to be able to bound it within a rectangle so you know what the max height and, and width are of this particular box. But underneath the hood, then, cities Cities.php, whose source code I won't uh, demonstrate, is doing a lookup in a MySQL database. Well, we give you a CSV file, not a MySQL database. So one of the first tasks for this project is going to be very representative of a typical problem. You've got a large data set that would take way too much effort to, by hand, insert into a real database where you can query it more effectively. So the first thing you'll write for this project is a little script called import. It's going to be written in PHP. And it's essentially going to iterate over that large CSV file. And for each row in it, insert a new row into a MySQL database of your design so that you actually have something to query later. And it's that database that cities.php is asking for a list of the cities between these particular coordinates based on what that database told you. Where did this database come from? Well, as the spec mentions, uh, we very easily, and with a few dollars, found it by way of Google zip code database. Uh, it's kind of neat what you can buy. Um, we, did, we passed on the $5 version. So we've upgraded this year. Last year, E75, we went with the $5 database, spread it out among uh, 160 plus students. We got really good bang for their buck. Um, what it didn't have, though, was relative city sizes. So what happened were our students' mashups looked great and they worked great, but you got news for cities you'd never heard of and certainly didn't really care about, unless it was yours. So we paid a bit more this year. I think we went up into the $70 range. But what we got was a much juicier database that's got all that information but population sizes for the cities. And what this will allow you to do is to more intelligently select the five biggest cities within view, which is more consistent, we propose, with what a user would hope to get by looking at a map and seeing news that comes back. And in fact, let me reveal 
this little bit of, uh, of motivation, if I go up to our project's length, you'll see that the original motivation for this particular project was the following. Let me go ahead and pull this up here. Uh, this, we'll say, was the inspiration for this project. How many, uh, have any of you ever played the Nintendo Wii? OK, some. OK, so if you haven't, you can use this as an excuse to go play video games at some friend's house. This is a demonstration of the Wii's news channel feature. So everyone likes a movie, so here we go. This, is, again, is a free tool that comes with the Nintendo Wii. And it lets you on your TV screen browse the news. We're getting closer to the, uh, the inspiration here. And if you've never seen the Wii, this isn't a person moving a mouse. It's one of those handheld controls that's completely wireless, and they're pointing at the screen. That is perhaps one of the coolest UI innovations I've ever seen, frankly, but also irrelevant. And here we go. So there's also this really neat feature where you can see a globe of the world, and on that globe are stacks of news articles, and therein lies the parallel to what you'll be implementing for Project 3. So over here in Europe, we see news articles whose heights, if you look on a higher quality screen, represent how many news articles there are. But this is precisely the spirit. So if you've ever needed an excuse to, again, go see a demo of the Nintendo Wii, you'll be implementing this same idea, but in the two-dimensional world of Google Maps. It's actually really wild what they did here. There's a lot of news happening in Washington there. So that URL, if you're curious, is available in the project spec. So it's a lot of fun. And this will hopefully bring to a nice climax the, pro the assigned projects in the course so that for the final project, which is largely of your own design, you can really go off and run in any number of directions, whether it's client-side JavaScript stuff, Ajax stuff, or more of the server-side uh, world. So any questions about where we're going with that? All right. So. Libraries and JavaScript. So you you got a little bit of a taste of JavaScript with Project Two, and you're doing a bit of client side validation, which, relatively speaking, is all fairly simple. JavaScript is more than just this toy language, though. That's good for triggering a little alert windows and just doing, say, validation of form fields. You can also do more sophisticated things, or at least more useful things. In fact, simple though this feature might be, notice that when I resize my window here. Notice that there are no scroll bars. And even though there are briefly, they well, a slight white lie uh, because of the height of that control. Notice that the map is dynamically resizing to be the size of this window, albeit with that gutter on the left hand, right hand, and bottom side. So this is actually pretty easy to do laterally. Like, How do you make something grow to fill the page in HTML or CSS in general? Specify everything in percentages, width equals 80% or 90% or something like that. And what about heights? Sorry? It's much more painful. You might think that it suffices to say height equals 80% or height equals a specific number of pixels. And that works. But if you do percentages, what happens is this. If I had said that I want this map to be 80%, or let's say for simplicity, 100% of the page, but I nonetheless want to have a form field up top, which takes up some number of pixels, what most browsers would do, if you say, I want this map to be 100%, therefore keep filling the page, but you know what? I kind of want to squeeze something up top. It would be 100% the height of the page. But what that means is that it would instead uh, be 100% um, of the page. This part of the map would actually be down here. So there's no way of saying, give me the remaining space vertically in a page, much like you can in terms of width. So it's very easy, for instance, to grow tables, HTML tables, laterally. But it's a lot harder when you want to stretch things out vertically. It's really annoying, frankly, to have to do this particular implementation detail. But it's very relatively easy to do with JavaScript. So conceptually, using the material from last week and a little teaser from that slide, like what could you listen for with regard to a page and its DOM to be able to figure out when you need to uh, execute some code to resize things using JavaScript. 
Yeah, so when the window resizes, right? If you remember or from the previous slide, frankly, or last week, among the laundry list of events that can be triggered are things like resize or page load and a whole suite of others. Well, pages load is probably useful if we want to initially set the size of a map, and reload. It's also useful if we want to resize a map or anything within the viewport on demand to an event like that. And so there are a number of ways of doing this. For instance, if you want to listen for the uh, load event for a page, the simple way in JavaScript is to write something like this window.onload. And then you can do something like this call a function called init. Okay, but later in your JavaScript code, you have to have something like this function init. And then in here, you would have to have some lines of code that do whatever you want to happen when that page、uh, loads up for the very first time. And there are a number of reasons you might want to do this. One, we said last week, is it might take some time for the browser to render a fairly complicated page, right? A, a page, for the most part, if、uh, well formed, is a tree, is a DOM. It might have some leaves that just because they're farther away in the page than the root node, it might take some time for the browser to finish rendering really large divs or really large tables that are in your document. And therefore, it might be dangerous. If you try to have JavaScript code executing the moment it is read into memory by the browser, which by default is going to read your HTML page top to bottom, left to right. right. So you don't want necessarily JavaScript code to execute the moment the page is loaded, but only once the whole page is loaded. And so the way of doing this typically is to register an event handler for something like the Windows onload event. Now, there's one、uh, sort of stylistic thing we can fix here. Do I need to have Mention of the function in it here and also down here. You can kind of do more elegant things, I would argue. You can, have, you can use these things called what in JavaScript? <laughs>、uh, anyone? They don't really have a name because they're anonymous functions, right? So you can actually say, you know what, go ahead and execute the following function that, you know what, doesn't need a name because I'm only going to call this. Here, I certainly don't need to refer to it later. So I can simply define the body of this function inline, do some stuff here, and then at the end of this block, I do close curly brace, semicolon, and this is all one line of JavaScript code. So this would allow me to execute only on the pages load this particular chunk of code. So we're doing something similar when the implementation of this mashup. The first thing we do on the pages load is we have to figure out the height. Of the browser's window, and maybe even the width of the browser's window, because then we go ahead and sort of manually, so to speak, take the div element inside of which is this map, and we set with JavaScript its CSS properties for both、uh, for definitely height and perhaps width, especially if you want to maintain a fixed gutter there on the side. It's not actually proportional, this one. I think that's always 20 or 30 pixels on the left and right hand side. So I can simply set those. Various CSS properties. How does one get at those properties? Do you recall from last week? We had a quick glimpse. If we know that the div, for instance, is called, suppose we have a div like this div ID equals map, and we'll see in a moment that that's all it takes to get a Google map into your own page. It's putting a placeholder like that and then telling Google's API what the ID is for that particular div. Later in my actual JavaScript code, which might be between tags like this, I could do something like this.、So Document.getElementById map. And let me go ahead and save this in a variable. So variable var map equals this. So now I have a variable that's pointing to what? What is being stored inside this variable called map at this moment in time? The div object. So it's, tech, it's, it's a reference to the node in the DOM that had the ID of map. So it's like we've plucked from the tree that particular node. And with it, we can access all of its、uh, children and so forth. But right now, the node in question is just that particular div. So I can actually resize that div, as you'll see, with something like this. Well, this is a, a, an HTML element. I know that the elements have style properties associated with them. So I can actually say something like this. Height equals quote unquote 100 pixels. And what this will do is, by way of JavaScript, change the stylization of that element, thereby overriding any stylization that was put, say, in a styles.css file or even in between a style attribute on the element. We can override that particular element. Well, we can also do something like this map.style.100. 
width. And we could similarly set it actually to percentages if you want. So any properties that are available to you with CSS, you can set using JavaScript. So again, the teaser here, and we won't reveal the full solution because I think it's most illustrative if you kind of play with this and understand exactly what you can and can't do with JavaScript vis-a-vis uh, -vis CSS. This hints at exactly how you go about resizing the map, or div in this case, in response to events on the page. But what I haven't taken into account, obviously, is the existing height of the browser. Right? How big is the whole viewport, uh, height and width? Turns out there's a number of ways. Some of them are not, in fact, cross-platform. This is another one of those details where you have to check, are you using Firefox or using IE? Because if the former, you have to check this property. If the latter, you have to check this one. Well, again, one of the upsides of using a tool like YUI, which I mentioned here and will continue to mention just because it's, uh, it's free and it's useful, is they have a number of utility functions built in that allow you to get the height, for instance, of the viewport. And I think it's get, dot, uh, get viewport height is the name of the function. OK, yeah. So that's a really good question. So there's a problem, actually, with doing this homemade approach to event handlers by saying the onload event handler is going to get this function. Because suppose you're writing a more sophisticated application that actually needs multiple things to happen at once. And some of those things might be to call functions that you yourself didn't write. In other words, you're really kind of stitching a lot of different code or libraries together. You can't really naively expect to know all in one place what you want to do. It'd be nice to say, you know what, execute this code onload but also execute this code on load and also this code on load. So again, one of the, so you could certainly implement that capability yourself by writing a function that conceptually checks, is this property already defined? And if so, um, I mean, you'd have to jump through a few hoops here. You could essentially copy its value, which is a, point, a reference to a function, write your own function, and then eval the function that was there, something like that. So it, this is not something that will roll on the fly in class here, because again, this is one of those wheels that needn't be invent, uh, reinvented. jQuery and a number of libraries provide the same functionality. The YUI provides this function. It's called yahoo.util.event. Think of these as namespaces. Add listener. And what's really neat about this particular function is it takes at least two ar uh, three arguments, or generally takes three arguments. The first is the ID or the, a reference to the object that you want to listen for events on. In this case, window is an element, is a node that you can just use. It's not, you don't have to declare it. It's just available to you. So I'm saying listen to the window for what event? The load event. And what do you want to do if the window hears that event? We'll go ahead and execute the following function. And this, recall, was the snippet of code we ended with last week that said call the blink function every half a second. And that blink function was called blinker, blinker, and we saw its source code last time. So what, in answer to your question, how can you chain functions together? Well, what these utility libraries would do for us is if you call add listener again and say, you know what, actually call this function. And you know what, add call this function, they'll be chained together, such that the first one you said, the first call to add listener's function will get executed first. The next function you registered with add listener would get called second and third and so forth. You could roll this your own, but again, these tools exist to facilitate such. Yeah? Could you also pass the function reference here as opposed to having it in the Absolutely. You can just put in the name of the function that you want to call if it's defined, in fact, elsewhere. Yep, absolutely. OK, so resize is another event altogether affiliated with the window. So that's an event you could listen for, either using sort of a homegrown approach here, if you don't need much sophistication, or using something like Yahoo or jQuery's libraries. Well, what do you really need to do? It doesn't suffice just to hard code in the size that you want to make that div at that moment in time, because there has to be some dynamism here. So in fact, if you were to implement this particular design, how many divs make up this page minimally, would you say? So prob, but sorry? At least two. Yeah, at least two, right? If you were laying this out, even if you're a little new to CSS and divs and this kind of stuff, you can kind of think of this page probably as two rectangles. One is at the top, and then one comprises the map. And the map maybe has some CSS padding around it or a margin, or maybe it's a div inside of a div. It's unclear at first glance. But simply, the simplest approach might be to have one div for the top 
part of the page with the form, and the other div actually contains the map. So if that's the case, let's assume for the moment that is the case. There's a div up there and a div down here, and you need to dynamically resize only one of those, the map, so that it stays within the viewport. I mean, just conceptually, mathematically, what do you need to do in your resize handler function to achieve such? OK, so you could check the height of the window itself, which we can, in fact, figure out reliably. And then you could figure out mathematically what percent, uh, how many pixels represent n percent of that particular window. And then you could use a very simple line of code like this to set it to the result of your mathematical computation. What other approach could you take? If it's not necessarily a percentage, but rather you want the top part to always stay the same size. It's just the map you want to grow. And therefore, you don't want a percentage increase in the map to mean that you're also increasing, for instance, the amount of padding at the top of the page. Right? If you say the map should take up eight. What's that? I was only going to do that on the map div. So only the map div would change size. OK, so only the map div changes size, but uh, you don't know. So you'll get into a bug if you start resizing the window if you don't know how big the top div is. Okay. Right? Right? So if you make the window particularly small, 80% of that window might now start to overlap the actual search area. So what's another approach that might redress that gotcha? Yeah, exactly. So find the whole height of the window, get the height of just that particular div, and then go ahead and leave the rest for the map. And again, you'll be able to do this in JavaScript using fairly simple approaches, built-in features like this. But again, there'll be some utility functions that you'll be welcome and encouraged to use, whether it's through YUI or another library that you would like to bite off. And in fact, what we'll encourage at this point in the course, even though I personally am a fan of using Yahoo, a wonderful thing to tackle, thank you, in the final project is to choose a library that appeals to you, maybe that some colleagues or friends have recommended, and to integrate it into your project simply so that, one, you can expose yourself to a new library altogether, and two, maybe try an alternative to something you've never liked. In fact, one of the criticisms of YUI is that uh, these function calls, like some in, in PHP, are very long. The function names are very long. jQuery, by contrast, is really slick and efficient with its notation, but there's a level of crypticness to it because of the abbreviation. So it's a trade-off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go into a secure area, and this is related to the final project that it gives you a, a warning about Ooh. Um, why you lie being an insecure uh, document and you're, you're in an SSL. Um, I don't know if it does that in, in Firefox. That's a good point, and the real there is. I will have to take a closer look at why that is happening. So just to recap for camera and others, there's a nuisance with various browsers when you, for instance, visit an SSL protected page, but some of the elements on that page, whether it's JavaScript or an image, is actually coming from an HTTP colon slash slash connection because you're mixing secure elements with insecure elements. And browsers will generally warn you about this. Um, not that a typical user would really appreciate the subtleties. So it's generally good to avoid this yourself by making sure that any time you have an SSL encrypted page, all of the content for that page actually comes from that same SSL connection. This is why Google, a year or more ago, finally started making Google Analytics available via HTTPS. Because previously, you would simply have to say, don't include Google Analytics on my SSL protected pages unless I want to worry the user with these browser-generated warnings. So I'll have to take a close look. Is it at the grades page or the bulletin board? Uh, Do you recall? So I'll have to take a look. It sounds like I have overlooked some URL that's pulling from HTTP, even though the whole bulletin board is being pulled via HTTPS. And what I suspect it is, to be honest, is we haven't clearly hard-coded in any HTTP URLs, but we use mod rewrite in our HT access file to do a lot of redirects. And I suspect I overlooked something that it's behind the scenes redirecting the user from HTTPS to HTTP. And that's why the browser is then yelling at us. So I'll take a look. Oh, that, well, could be. But if you're mentioning UE specifically, it could, it sounds like my fault, more likely. But yes, absolutely. If they were allowed to post HTML that has like an image source tag that's pointing elsewhere, yes, absolutely. And in fact, something like that happened a few months ago until we addressed that particular bug, so to speak.
Okay, other questions? Okay, so just to summarize, if we are in fact implementing our map with the two divs, a div for the map itself, a div for the thing up top, there will be ways, you'll see, to compute what the height of that top div is, what the height of the whole window is, do a little basic arithmetic, figure out what the height of the map should be, and set the CSS properties accordingly. What you'll find, though, is that you do need to be aware that when you set these properties, it is literally a string. It is not a number that you're setting the height and the width to, like 100. You do, in fact, turn it into a string with something like px. And another little say tool to put into your toolkit. If you do something like this, var current height gets map.style.height. Well, this is going to return to you, perhaps needless to say, a um, string but only if there has been set already the height property for that element. So in other words, the height property and the width property are null. They're undefined values unless you've explicitly set them in a CSS file or in a style equals quote unquote attribute in your XHTML, which means that even though a div might be taking up some amount of height, you can't figure it out, it would seem, unless that height was explicitly mentioned in CSS. So there is another approach to this altogether. And you will see, for instance, as part of the Yahoo library, let me pull this up, there's a function called getRegion, which is the solution to that. So this is sort of the Java doc or the PHP.net of uh, YUI's library. You'll see that there's a function they support called Yahoo dot, whoops, that's the class. Uh, get re so there's this function here called getRegion. It is in the package, so to speak, called yahoo.util.region. So yahoo.util.region.getRegion will apparently return a region that is occupied by the DOM element. And what you will see um, is that this returns an object that's got a few properties, among which are top, bottom, left, right. And again, with some basic arithmetic, you can figure out dynamically what the height and width of any element in the page is, even if that height and width was not specified by the user in CSS, but was just dynamically computed by the browser based on how big those elements actually are or how big the default font size is of the page. So this is a lot to throw at once, but this will all come together nicely with Project 3, which ultimately does not actually require that much code. Now you saw the minified version, and clearly it doesn't take much code. Mine was all in one line. But even when it's expanded, it's not a lot of code. It's more about a lot of thought for this last project. So any questions? OK, so let's give you a quick taste. Um, and Sid has gr uh, graciously brought us uh, handouts, which we'll distribute during break. Let's take a quick uh, peek at some of these other libraries that I've been alluding to so that YUI is perhaps not your only takeaway from the course. So among the most popular libraries out there for JavaScript are these. And they come in two flavors, and sometimes both flavors. So one flavor are general utility functions, like the ones we've been talking briefly about with YUI, things like DOM event handling and checking the height and width of things. Some really useful functions that are by design cross-platform. You don't have to care about what browser the user is using. But the other type of libraries that exist out there in great number even beyond this list here, are user interface mechanisms, like a little pop-up calendar, like a little drop-down menu, uh, little widgets, so to speak. So in fact, if you recall from last week, when we pulled up this particular site that I'd been working on with the college, well, there are some very basic features here, um, one of which are tabs. So tabs is a very common UI pattern these days. And it's not really something that I thought would be very fun to figure out how to implement. Um, I'm sure I could do it, but everyone else is doing it. Hopefully, someone has sort of made this problem easy. And in fact, those two tabs, events and calendars, are purely JavaScript generated. I called a function that's called add tab. I told it the name of the tab I want. And I did change the CSS so that they'd look the way I want, but they're all dynamically generated. I didn't really have to do that part by hand. Also, I decided that when a user takes an interest in some event like this one and they want to add it to their calendar, I wanted a little drop-down menu. Well, I didn't really want to implement this myself. And I also didn't want the arguably ugly select menus that I could embed next to each event. I wanted something a little sexier but simpler. And so I used YUI's menu library. So you'll actually see if you poke around underneath the hood of this one or also the other mashup that we looked at last week, 
that they are in some sense a mashup, but not of so much data sources, but of um, various different libraries that really make it easier to get things up and running quickly so that you yourself don't have to go and implement everything. For instance, I'm sure with a little bit of effort I could implement the notion of autocomplete so that you can type in words like this and automatically get prompted. But so many other people have solved that problem. Why do I need to now figure out how everyone else solved it? Again, a widget comes to my uh, Savior, uh, comes to the save there. So the catch is that you kind of have to understand how all this stuff works so that you can actually wire it up together. And even in our mashup for this particular project, there's a lot of free data out there. There's a lot of free maps, but it's you who has to figure out how to glue these things together and do something interesting with them. And therein lies, I think, frankly, a lot of the fun of mashups and this, this trend behind them. So what else is out there? Well, let me go ahead and pull up uh, Scriptaculous whose domain I can never quite remember how to spell, since it's one of these delicious type funky ones. But Google is your friend. All of that, you might think it's Flash. It's JavaScript. So you can actually do some maybe tacky, blink-like features um, using CSS and JavaScript. But it is, in fact, possible. Um, let me go ahead and click out, let's see, these demos. What you'll find. Unfortunately, is, these, um, doc is that these things vary in their quality of documentation. And frankly, I'm a little biased toward good documentation over slick, fancy features. And YUI, for instance, is wonderful about documentation and examples and source code and all of that. Uh, but let's choose something like this, combination effects demo, which has a lot of little building blocks that you can use. So here is a demo of their fade effect. So you can apply this effect if you use Scriptaculous's library to any div or any other element. OK, so pretty sexy if you want to do that. Puff is kind of cool, just kind of blows up and goes away. You can have a little blind feature, a little blind up. You can imagine these being very easily abused. Uh, you got a little of this. Right, there, you'll often find, especially in JavaScript, there are a lot of things you can do, a la blink doesn't mean you should do them. <laughs> All right, slide up, slide down, just turn it uh, on and off. Pulsate, there is, there's your annoying one. Squish, fold, grow, shrink, and highlight. So that's uh, Scriptaculous, for instance. Another one, let me pull up uh, jQuery for just a moment. Since jQuery, of all of the ones on the list, is probably the most popular today, both for uh, syntactic features, just shorthand notation that it supports, and also for some of the UI mechanisms. Uh, if I go ahead to. Are those special effects you just showed, those only apply to divs? Like you file them against divs? Uh, they can apply to other elements, but what many of these libraries do for consistency so that things render properly is you typically wrap things of interest with divs so that it works with higher probability. Uh, let me see if I can choose something like this just to get a quick example how jQuery works. Let's see if I can pick this up here. Uh, the basics. OK, so this is representative of a very common approach in jQuery. So at the very top there, you have the approach that we ourselves just talked about, sort of the old-fashioned way, roll it yourself. Down here is jQuery's approach to the same idea. And this doesn't really capture the utility of something like jQuery, because this doesn't look like that many fewer lines of code. But the dollar sign notation is something that's very common in this particular library, just calling simple functions and then passing in arguments that are a little more succinct than, say, the doing it yourself approach, and certainly more succinct than the YUI approach. This kind of code here is representative. For instance, this is maybe even more powerful. If I scroll down just a tad here, you'll see that uh, jQuery makes it pretty easy to add click handlers. You simply say, Go ahead and give me back all elements of type A in the page, so all of my anchors in the page. And that's pretty powerful, and it's certainly more succinct than document.getElementsByTagName, quote unquote, A, for instance, or get elements, yeah, by tag name. And then apparently we just out call its click function, pass in an anonymous function here, and call event, and say this is what happens when you click on this particular um, Elements. So I would say for project three, don't bite off more than you need to. I would maybe use YUI just because this is what I myself tend to put examples in. But for final project time, I would absolutely consider doing something with one of these libraries. And why uh, jQuery has this UI package to it. Let me just glance at this, see if we can pick some neat little widgets. And that's what these things do in fact tend to be called. How about a little date picker? So this is one of those things that's pretty commonly useful. 
but pretty much a pain in the neck to implement yourself. Um, this is one of the uglier ones, I would argue, but um, something like this, not something you want to waste time uh, of implementing, you can go ahead and borrow that. Dialog, this is a common approach too. If you want to have sort of an overlay on your screen that's modal or not, maybe it will gray the whole background and draw the user's focus to the middle of the page, these kinds of things too. Most of these libraries actually come with. And I can never quite find the right link, but let me go ahead and pull up uh, Dojo just to hint at something that has always caught my eye as, wow, that's really kind of cool, but then I temper myself and realize, that, yeah, but that doesn't mean I should put it into my own project. Uh, let me go ahead and choose this. Dojo has, I'd say, the worst documentation of, of them, but turns out you can do this little effect. Which I've sort of, this is sort of a solution in search of a problem for myself. Um, I'm not really sure where I want to use this, but I was kind of wowed that you can do something like this. So again, beware. It's very, we're going to see some really ugly final projects if you don't <laughs> regulate yourself. So let's go ahead and take a five minute break. Handouts are now here, thanks to Sid, and we'll resume in a few. All right, we are back. So even if you don't end up using any of these libraries, a fun if, you, if you're this sort of person, like me, a fun thing to do one night is to curl up with Wikipedia's description of these several libraries and the URLs that we have here and just poke around at what each of them can do and try to give, get a sense for yourself of which might appeal to you. Um, because frankly, in the world of JavaScript these days, especially as the world moves more toward AJAX and, and um, very nice user interface mechanisms, all of which are client-side driven, you kind of want to take advantage of some of these tools and libraries and not do everything yourself, case in point project three. Um, I will say, too, that there are different considerations you might want to put into them that even I didn't initially. So matters of accessibility, for instance, for folks who need to use screen readers or other um, sort of aspects of code that many people might otherwise overlook. Do read the fine print and the reviews of these various tools. One of the reasons that I've been using for the college's stuff, YUI, is that they actually have a very explicit um, devotion to thinking through some of the accessibility uh, implications of doing dynamically generated DOM nodes and various UI mechanisms like this. And some of these libraries, if you Google around, you'll see have just not worried about that because they're, they're content to sort of ignore that particular um, set of needs. So just realize before you paint yourself into a corner and realize, damn, this doesn't do something that I need it to do. Um, so this is another one of those tools to tuck away in your toolkit. One of the hopefully good takeaways of, of following along with lectures like these. The fellow who organizes this site is a savior. He has documented and has done various tests on all sorts of headaches that arise among the various browsers and their implementations of JavaScript and the W3C specifications and such. For instance, the one that I bemoaned last, uh, just last week was this display property in CSS, which only the hard way did I realize that IE just flat out does not support table row, table cell, table, um, table. Um, when it comes to this property, which meant the map, when I implemented it using this CSS property, it just didn't work in IE. And no matter how hard I banged my head against the wall, it just would not work. And so I had to rip out this approach altogether and rely on something that was more, um, that was a completely different design altogether. So think of this site, frankly. Think of Google and some keywords like quirks mode as the place to go, especially if you're battling what appears to be some very obscure cross-platform issue. Um, this fellow has done a remarkable job at documenting and staying current with some of those issues. It's sort of the one of the places to know about if you're going to continue to dabble in this, in this space. So jslint.com is another wonderfully valuable site for as a syntax checker. Um, think of this kind of sort of in the spirit of the W3C's validator for XHTML code, whereby it asks you to paste in your JavaScript code that you've written. And for the course, you're welcome to use this, especially if it helps you catch things you might otherwise overlook. You click the JSLint button, and it's, um, it's, uh, it parses your code. And it analyzes your code for mistakes or potential mistakes. It'll catch things like missing parentheses sometimes or things that might be forgivable by JavaScript, leaving off semicolons, for instance, but are not necessarily a good habit to get into. And there's a various features down at the bottom of the page. I would say once you have some JavaScript code for Project 3 or something else, go ahead and paste it in and see what it says. Um, you can paste one-liners into it, certainly. But this becomes more useful for something like Project 3 in the final project when your code is not 
just one-liners for validity checking, but something that's a little meatier still. And you'll find that it's strongly recommended to run your code through a static analyzer like this before trying to minify it with something like those compressing tools, because those tools rely on your code being as parsable without white space as with it. And if you are taking various shortcuts that browsers might forgive, lack of white space here, lack of semicolon here, but that as soon as you collapse all that white space, your code becomes ambiguous, those compressors can break your code. So one of the things, again, they recommend is that you analyze it with a tool like this, and this is sort of the tool for such within JavaScript, and then compress it so that you can maximize the probability that it will work as well compressed as it would uncompressed. Other tools to bear in mind are these two, I would say. Both sort of come strongly coupled with Firefox, but Firebug is probably the tool to use, whether it's with experimenting with DOM nodes and seeing, inferring from a page how it's laid out, what the divs are, what they're called, experimenting with various properties and attributes on the elements, and also for JavaScript. And the one thing to beware, lest you use the wall, is that when you click the Firebug icon in the bottom right, the first time you visit a site and want to debug it, whether it's yours or someone else's, you need to enable the various features for Firebug simply by checking, what I typically do is all of these boxes so that you have all of the features of Firebug at your disposal. And what you'll find Firebug initially most useful for for Project 3 is that if you have some syntax error or some bug in your JavaScript that is detectable by a machine, you will see in one of these tabs down here a very clear error message telling you what line of code erred. Um, and hopefully you can then infer what you should do about it to fix it. So don't try tackling much JavaScript coding, I would say, without one of these tools installed. What about compressors? So Yahoo comes with one, and they claim that it's 30% better than the other guys. Um, I would experiment with any of them. Um, using any one of them is probably fine. All of these things happen to be free here. Uh, YUIs, for instance, is a Java jar file you download. You have to have Java installed, and then you run the Java binary on your JS file, and it spits out to standard output the compressed version of it, which you then save in a file, and you distribute that code instead of the original. Um, D, uh, Packer is another popular one that tries to obfuscate the code uh, in another way altogether. You'll find that code here looks like this. Let's see if they show us an example. Uh, yeah, I think you could go ahead and paste in a large example here. What you'll find is that Dean Packer's approach to this kind of encrypts the code such that it then has to be decrypted by a function that is included along with the output. So my anecdotal reading about this has suggested that for large JavaScript files, even though this makes the code look a lot more obfuscated and a lot scarier, especially for a neophyte to figure out what you're doing, if intellectual property and such is your goal, or protection is your goal, um, it's certainly still reversible. And rumor has it that the reverse for large files, it's relatively expensive to decode this code. Um, and you're just wasting CPU cycles using something like this. So just beware. Just realize that if it depends on who your adversary is. If it's someone who knows no JavaScript whatsoever, probably you don't even need to do any of these various tools. Um, something like YUI certainly obfuscates it enough that it's going to be annoying to try to figure out what the other person did. You might as, if you're smart enough to figure out how this obfuscated code works, you're probably smart enough to implement the code yourself, um, which is sort of an implicit uh, protection anyway um, in any of these kinds of tools. But here's a pretty good list of what the options are out there. So let's take a look at actually using this stuff. So I have, we've included among tonight's printouts a few different approach to Google Maps. So this is the teaser for project three in more detail. And then next week, what we'll do this week is just assume that there is this magic called Ajax, whereby Google's library is using Ajax to grab you more and more map tiles to show you what the current uh, map view is. But we're not going to worry until next week about how that actually works underneath the hood, at which point we will um, peel away those layers and show you how to implement Ajax sort of from scratch without using any of these libraries and understand exactly what is go going on underneath the hood. But for now, let's take a look at what you can do with it on a higher level. So among tonight's examples, we have these. The first, the first. All right, we'll let that whir away. And let me go ahead and do the following. So Google, Google Maps API. So 
the first stop destination that the uh, spec for Project 3 brings you to is this one here. And you'll see at the side right, there's a few steps involved in getting started with Google Maps API. And this is pretty representative of how you can interface with Google's various APIs. And I would say that, frankly, it is the fact that Google and companies like it have made such interesting data so easily available to people that has completely transformed, I think, what sort of normal people like me are capable of doing relatively easy with, again, just some basic sort of glue and stitching capabilities, a la Mashup. So one, sign up for a Google Maps API key. What does that mean? It means you have to, for free, generate a really long random number using Google's website that you then paste into the head of your web page documents that are going to use Google's API. And this is their way of tracking who's using their code. I'll show you just so you've seen it once before. You'll need a Google account or a Gmail account to do this. You'll probably want to skim the fine print there. And then the very last question they ask you at the bottom is to agree to their terms of service and then to type in the URL of your domain in which you're going to be using Google Maps in some form. For this project, as the spec advises, you're going to type in project3.yourdomainname.com or whatever it is. But realize those of you, which is many of you, who are developing the course's projects on your own computers, if you try to use that key, while using XAMPP, for instance, your URLs aren't going to match. Your URLs are going to say what instead? Like localhost or 127.0.0.1? Not a problem. Just register another key for localhost. And use that one while developing, but when you upload it to the server, just swap it out. Otherwise, you will get some uh, JavaScript pop-up from the API saying you're trying to use this on the wrong domain and your code is just going to break, typically. You won't see any map tiles and your JavaScript just won't work. It's probably the result of this key. So once you go ahead and do this, um, you will get back something that looks a little cryptic, but that's fine because you never once have to think about it again that looks like this. They will give you a script tag, uh, HTTP maps google.com slash maps dot dot dot. And notice these attributes here. We have an attribute called, whoops, we have an attribute, uh, a, par a parameter called what? Key, and then another called sensor. These are the only two you have to change. Sensor is false. Sensor equals true is a new feature of the API. It's for things like cell phones that kind of might be able to sense someone's location. Your browser probably can't do that. So false. And that really long secret, key, not even secret key, because everyone in the world can see it, that really long key just gets pasted in there. And you never once have to think about it again. And so in, in fact, funny thing about this project is that you're going to probably write far fewer files than you have for any of the other projects. You're advised to create one file initially, index.html. And inside of that is certainly going to go your XHTML, maybe even your JavaScript code, or you can factor it out to a .js file. Maybe you'll have a .css file, and you will have that import file and one PHP file, cities.php or whatever you call it. But you're not going to have multiple pages. And in fact, a .html file is perfectly sufficient for something like this, which at the end of the day is mostly JavaScript driven. So realize that uh, now. So how do you get up and uh, how do you get going? with, say, the Hello Maps, uh, damn, Hello World of Google Maps. Right? How do you embed something very simply into a web page? It's actually very easy. So this is a well-formed XHTML document. I copied and pasted the doc type and the HTML elements and this stuff you know, from past examples. Notice that I have embedded the script tag per our discussion here. And then this is all I decided to do for this particular demo. I'm embedding an inline JavaScript using this script element here. Why, by the way, do I use the C data funkiness here? Yeah, so that it validates, right? I, I don't appear to have used any scary things like uh, less than symbols or greater than symbols, but a good habit, again, is just to put the whole thing in C data and to prepend the C data dis, um, declaration with slash slash so that the JavaScript interpreter doesn't choke on your C data declaration. And then at the end, slash slash, close the C data section. Well, what am I doing? I'm apparently defining a JavaScript function called load, could have called it anything, that does just one fundamental thing. It first asks, is this browser Google capable? So is G browser is capable is the name of the API function that just returns true or false. We support this browser or we don't. If they do, I go ahead and execute two lines of code, which if ever there were a powerful um, demo, this line of code followed by this one is all it takes to embed a Google map in your own web page. What am I doing? It looks like I'm declaring a variable called map. I'm calling a constructor function called gmap2, version 2 of Google Maps API, 
Where do I want to put that map? Well, per our discussion earlier, I'm going to put it in, in a div whose ID attribute is apparently quote unquote map. Arbitrary on my part, could have been anything, but simple. Now, the one and only one line of code that you must execute for that map to render uh, inside of that element is I need to set the center of the map. How do you do that? Well, you don't just specify latitude, comma, longitude. You instead pass in what's called a, um, a, point, a G point element or a G lat long uh, element or object, rather, if we're going to use the uh, more familiar uh, uh, verbiage here. So this is another constructor, another class, if you will, that comes in Google's API. And by passing in this, followed by this, an object or a reference to an object is being returned that represents that GPS coordinate, which I then pass to the set center function as its sole or as its first argument. And the very last argument passed to set center is what, do you think? Yeah, it's zoom level. So you know from Google Maps probably you can zoom in and out. Well, there's 17 or maybe 19 different zoom levels that Google supports. I forget which. And you simply choose one of them. How do you figure it out? Well, trial and error. Or you poke around at what is familiar to you. 13 is kind of the nice one, I think, at least for getting a decent sense of the city. So let's go ahead and pull up. Uh, oh, that was interesting. I didn't chamad properly, it seems. Let's go into this real quick. Chamad. OK, and this is map1.html, and that's it. So in fact, I literally just copied and pasted the default latitude and longitudinal coordinates that Google likes to use, which is for their offices in Palo Alto. But that's it. It's a Google map. It's a very underwhelming map. This really doesn't do much at all, though I did apparently implement the drag and drop feature, which really didn't take much effort on my part. Um, but you'll notice some. <laughs> <laughs> you see some things you get for free. But again, speaking to kind of cross-platform nuisances, see this little white border that I very clearly did not put around this map? That's because the body of various browsers has a margin. And this is one of the things Yahoo's reset library does. It puts it all to zero. And those kinds of things are the points we've been making over time. So let's do something a little more interesting than this. But first, let us make sure that it's clear what's going on here. Because all I did was define a load function where did I actually call that function? Yeah, on the onload property. So not everything has to be pure JavaScript. There are some XHTML elements that come with attributes that themselves can contain as values snippets of JavaScript code. And we've seen that with the on click stuff and on key press and the, the tricks you probably used in part for project two. So this is saying on the body's load, go ahead and call this function, which I wrote, and on the page's unload, call this function, gunload. In the interest of minimizing the risk of browser memory leaks, Google recommends that you call gunload as the user exits your page, whether it's by closing the browser or by visiting another website altogether. So I just knew that from the documentation. And there was no need for me to write my own function since that one exists. Yeah. Uh, not quite. So most of your code will be in JavaScript for this project, except for two pieces. One is the one-time import script. You'll write a script that reads in that CSV file, inserts it into a MySQL database, and then you never again run that code. Um, but it's useful code because copying and pasting 42,000 rows, very time consuming. Two is going to be you're going to implement the equivalent of cities.php. And we'll talk more about that next week in the context of Ajax. But as we inferred for my example, that PHP code is going to live within your domain. It's going to take in some arguments like the GPS coordinates of the current map in view. And then it has to somehow return a list of cities within that view so that you can fetch news for those cities. And in fact, that script can actually return the news articles themselves and more. So we'll see that more next week. So three pieces. This client-side JavaScript stuff, which is most of the code, the import script, and the cities or equivalent script. OK. All right. How did I choose the height and width for my map? I didn't try to do any of this sexy dynamism growing to fill the page. I just arbitrarily said this map will be that height and that width. And that is one way that you can do this. All right, let's take a look at something a little more interesting. So this thing fills the viewport, fills the browser window using CSS. So just a baby step toward our more, um, our, our prettier map is achieved simply by way of this one change. So style, the height is 100%, the width is 100%. But again, sort of to reveal that you kind of have to do appreciate the implications of various browsers. I do, for some browsers, need to specify that the body of my page is itself 
100% uh, height and with no margin. Otherwise, you don't quite get 100% height. And you might notice up here that on the HTML element, I've also put this as well. So this is, again, one of those headbanging quirks that you might stumble across. But this satisfies that goal uh, for various browsers. In fact, let me do this. Let me go ahead and cop do this uh, for a moment and see if we can replicate. So let's pull up map2.html. And this one looks like this here. So already it looks better, right? This was minimal effort, but at least it doesn't look like a stupid map in the top left-hand corner. Now I've actually filled the page. And it does, in fact, scale to fill the browser. And notice, no scroll bars. So it actually doesn't seem on first glance that hard to achieve the goal I alluded to before, having it fill the page without scroll bars. But that's because we have nothing up top there. So just a quick and dirty example here. If I go in and on top of this div, I do something like this. Another div and another div here. And I do something like this uh, form. And I'm going to omit some attributes for uh, time's sake. Input type equals text. And then how about an input type equals submit. Whoops. Submit and let's say close form. So again, just doing this for time's sake. Let's go ahead and reload. And now the annoying stuff starts to happen, right? Like this is not what we mean by filling the page. This is arguably a bad UI thing. And the irony is that you can never quite get rid of it. Because <laughs> what is the div actually resizing relative to? The map is 100% of the height of the viewport, but there's something else taking up some of the viewport. So yes, it's 100%, but it doesn't start at the top of the page. So this is the kind of thing that, as annoying as it is to deal with, is a very representative of the kinds of nuances that come in when you start coding client side and creating more dynamic UIs. It's not as simple yet as one might like. So therein lies uh, some of the, therein lies the teaser. Well, let's get rid of that then, lest it look like a bad example. All right, gone. All right, so what more can we do here? So a map with controls. This is not a very uh, impressive Google map, because especially once I get rid of the search bar, this map really does nothing. The only way you can look things up on this map are clicking and dragging until you find the location you're looking for. You can't even change the zoom level of the map. So it turns out Google makes it very easy to do more interesting things with their map. And all of these tricks come from straight from the documentation. So what can I do? Well, now I've started commenting my code because we're doing a little more uh, stuff of interest. Let me go ahead and take a look. I'm instantiating my map. This is the same as before. I'm centering the map, this time on Harvard Science Center. So I Googled around and I figured out with trial and error what the GPS coordinates are of Harvard Science Center. And then I wanted to do a little more. I wanted to add a control. So it turns out, if you look at the documentation, that there's this thing called GMAP type control that allows the user to change the type of the map that they're looking at. Is it a hybrid map? Is it a satellite map? Is it a cartoonish map? What type is it? And the means by which you can add this are as follows. First, I instantiate that type of control, that object. Uh, then I go ahead and add it by way of the map.addControl function. So again, two steps. Instantiate the control, tell it where you want it to be added, and then you're done. What else can I do? Well, there's this G large map control, that thing on the top left that lets you zoom in and out and pan left and right and see the little street view man. Well, that's called their, G, uh, their map control feature. It's added very similarly. And notice, just to show the different approaches to code here, as you probably know from other languages, you don't really need this variable here, it seems, if I'm immediately using it elsewhere. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but notice that you can do one-liners here too, especially if you don't need any kind of reference to that object later. And then this is pretty cool. I just, it's very impressive when the, squeal, uh, the scroll wheel works. I can't simulate it here on my keyboard, but it's really not hard to enable the user to zoom in and out with their little mouse's scroll wheel, because Google has a function for just that. So again, you can make very impressive things very quickly if the tools are there for you. So here is map3.html, and it's already better. It still fills the viewport. It shows us Cambridge. Now I've got this control at top left. I've got those controls at top right. And that's it. What was that six, eight lines of code maximally? They really have lowered the bar to doing some neat things. The fourth example here. Now I want to drop a marker and an info window, as Google calls their little cartoonish bubble things. And let me go ahead and do this. So let me scroll down. And again, I've just been copying and pasting my key in every file. You can use it as many times in as many files as you want, all within the same domain. What did I do this time? Well, notice that this time I'm doing 
Um, same lines of code here. And notice, though, that I did factor this out. So I'm this time declaring a point here, this time because I want to reuse that point. And we'll see why in a moment. But here I am centering my map around that point and calling a zoom level of 13. Let me go ahead and zoom out for just a moment. What would a zoom level of, a zoom level of 5 look like? Actually, let's back up lest we spoil the, the fun there. Let me go back here to this 13. Let me change the zoom level to 5 in map3.html. Well, that's zoom level 3. All right, still centered on Cambridge, though not quite as clearly. Zoom level 2, getting a little farther. It's still arguably centered on Cambridge. Zoom level 1, it's probably going to be a little ridiculous. Now we're really zoomed out. How about those 17? This might be a little excessively close to the Science Center. It's right there. But notice, I look what I did. I implemented the satellite feature right, by one function call. It's pretty cool what you can do. And this is, in fact, centered on the Science Center there. And in fact, let's see, we can make this lecture all the more intimate. Where are we? We are, there it is. That is us on a much nicer day right on campus. And all this, I made this in E75. All right, so let's now do something with the little cartoonish bubbles and show how you can use this. And notice, these are all very deliberate examples in that we're going to need all of these features for that mashup. So I'm going to center the map on the Science Center using that G lat longitudinal point that I just, uh, defined. And then I'm doing this. I'm going to mark the Science Center with what Google calls a G marker. So a G marker is the little red push pin thing that gets dropped on a location. How do I do that? Well, I'm apparently declaring a G marker and its constructor takes one argument, a point object. Well, I already declared that point object because I already, a moment ago, centered the map on that same point. But a marker itself now exists at that location. And you can think of markers as an example of what Google calls overlays. So if you think of the map as being kind of a canvas, you can put a lot of plastic clear transparencies on top of the map to create the illusion of things being on the map. And one such thing is a marker. So the map always is there underneath the hood. And we're going to lay on top of it a transparency that right now has a little push pin like thing on it at that particular location. And I do that simply by calling the add overlay function. In fact, I did something very similar um, in the maps example last week when I drew all of the shadows on that um, Harvard maps example. Well, all of those shadows are examples of polygons that are drawn using Google's APIs. But I drew all those polygons on a blank um, piece of plastic, essentially. Then I called add overlay to lay it on top of the campus so that it could very easily be removed. Well, scrolling down, I needed to do a little bit of magic. And let's not look at the code just yet, but instead look at the net effect. So here is map4.html. There's my marker planted right dead center in the map. But notice what it's about to do. If I hover over this, I'm actually going to get my little cartoon bubble. I have the name of the Science Center and then the URL that I found on Wikipedia. So how do you do this? Well, you can probably imagine already kind of sort of how this is implemented underneath the hood. Right? If you're generally familiar or more familiar now with CSS, you might know that there are, certainly there are divs that can be absolutely positioned. They don't have to be relative. You can say, put it here. And that's probably a useful feature when you know the center coordinates of the dot that you want to put a little bubble over. You might know of this thing called z-index which is the z-axis in a web page. So you can have the map at z-index of 0, and then an overlay, like a little cartoon bubble, at z-index of 1, so that literally it's on top of the map instead of, say, underneath it. And you can have any number of z-indexes. So anytime you've seen a site where there's interesting elements that overlap, it's probably because they're using different z-index properties within CSS. But Google has hidden all of those details. But frankly, it's pretty darn sexy that they're even able to add little ping um, shadows on top of the map these days, too. And you don't even have to do that. But how do we now use their API to implement all of those neat basic JavaScript and CSS tricks. Well, here, I'm borrowing the same idea of event listeners. So Google comes with a lot of functions that come with YUI and with jQuery. They call it their own things. You probably when you're using their API, you want to use their functions and not try to mingle functions just because. Better to go with what they're meant for. Uh, what 
what's packaged together. So in this case, rather than use YUI's add listener function, I'm going to stay with what they gave me, g event dot add listener. It's the same type of function, but what does it take in this case? Well, its first argument is apparently a reference to an object that you want to listen to. What do you want to listen for on that object? Apparently, the event called click. Well, what do we want to do if that particular marker is clicked? Well, you want to execute the following anonymous function. Well, this function does what? Apparently, it's declaring what here? What's this first line of code they're doing? Yeah, it's just a string. I'm just creating, apparently, line by line, the concatenation of a big string. And I could do this in any number of maze, may, ways, maybe a little more efficiently even. But it's not much code, so I didn't worry too much about that. Now I'm putting Science Center in bold. I have a couple of BR tags being appended to that. Here's that link from Wikipedia. And then I'm closing the tag down here so that at this point in the story, I have a JavaScript variable that's of type string, essentially. In that string is a bunch of HTML. And it turns out, in the API, there's a function called open info window HTML that is associated with the map. So it's a method on the map object. It takes two arguments, the point where you want to plop that uh, info window and the XHTML that you want to show inside of it. Now, by default, these info windows will be positioned at that location on the map, but they're going to be hidden until the, actually, let me take a step back, um, rather, when the user clicks on this red marker, what's going to happen? This string is going to be dynamically constructed. The info window that comes with Google Maps is going to be displayed at a particular point, And on the fly, that string is going to be inserted into that little bubble. So you'll see, and if you play with Google Maps, they only let you have one info window open at any one time. Even if there's lots of markers on the screen, clicking on one closes any other info window, because there's just one info window object, so to speak. And this just allows me to update on the fly what's actually inside of it. So when I do, in fact, click on this, the event that gets triggered is click. That induces execution of that anonymous function that creates that string, opens the info window, and passes in the point at which it should be shown and that actual, um, and that actual HTML string. So any questions thus far? All right, well, let's look at one other example and then take a look at where all of the building blocks came from. So this version here does the following in map5.html. So this version here, when I click that link, actually finds the current stock price of Google. All right, so for better or for worse, um, this is not necessarily a compelling mashup, not really the most efficient way of getting your latest stock quotes, but it does pull together a lot of these pieces as well as some from Project One. So let's just get a, a taste of this because it's also, a conversation will continue next week. So this code that starts us off here is all very similar. This time I'm centering on Palo Alto instead of Cambridge. I have a marker. I have a point. It's all the same. But here's the interesting part. So Ajax, again, is this technology that allows us to dynamically grab more content from a server and integrate it into the current web page without changing the whole browser's window. So what am I doing here? Well, apparently, when that marker is clicked, rather than do something hard-coded like show me the Science Center's name and URL, I'm calling this the create method on this class called GXML HTTP. So think of this as a teaser again for next week. What am I opening a connection to? Apparently a file called quote3.php. And I'm passing in symbol of goog. And then I'm passing in true, which just means make it asynchronous. Uh, then I'm saying this. And again, we'll spend much more time on this next week, on ready state change. So this is another event handler that we haven't really seen yet that says when this AJAX calls state changes, like something interesting happens, like data came back, do the following, execute this anonymous function. And I check, all right, is the ready state 4? 4 means good. So for tonight, 4 is good. And 200 is even better. 200 is the HTTP status code that normally you don't see, which is a good thing. But now that I'm sort of coding closer to the browser, I need to know, was this a 404, a 500, a 403, or 200? If it's a 200, all is well. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and dynamically create a string for the name Google couple of BRs, and then this little trick here, where now we're commingling stuff from last week as well, I'm going to dive into the XML that apparently was returned by quote3.php. I'm calling get element by tag name, because somewhere in that XML, I apparently decided to embed an uh, element called quote and bracket 0. Why might I be doing that? 
It's probably an array that's being returned, but hopefully I just have one quote element, so I want the zeroth element to come back. In fact, we can mimic this. Let's just take a quick look here. Let me go ahead and grab the string that I'm actually requesting. It's probably in the same directory as a result, so let me go ahead and paste in. Quote three dot PHP question mark symbols equals Goog hit enter and in fact what I get back is a little snippet of code that really is based off of what we did for CS75 Finance. I borrowed some of the same kind of code for connecting to Yahoo, grabbing the data, but rather than just spit out the data in HTML, I decided to spit out some interesting data in XML. This is my own proprietary format. I called the, no, the elements whatever I wanted them to, the attributes whatever I wanted them to, but this is sort of a canonical example of asynchronous JavaScript and XML because what I'm returning to my own JavaScript code is a snippet of XML that by way of these uh, JavaScript DOM functions I'm then grabbing the nodes that I care about so that I can then dynamically insert it into the page by grabbing the tag called price the very first one of those, its first child, its node value. This just means get the text value that was sent back inside of those open tag and close tags. I'm going to prepend a dollar sign to it, and then I'm going to call open info window HTML so that if we were actually still here during trading hours, every time I click this marker, I would get back a different value. And notice there is a bit of latency. There's a slight delay because if I sniff my own traffic here with live HTTP headers, Notice what happens when I click on this link. That just happened. Then I can make this a little more clear if I move this to the side. I go ahead and close this and click it again. Left hand side shows my browser traffic. Something's happening behind the scenes. What is it that's happening? Well, I'm requesting that particular get string there. So it's a very easy way of getting up and going with some AJAX. So let's take a look at this then. A Google Maps API. This is a site with which you'll get very familiar over the next few weeks. And it's kind of addictive how easily you can do neat things. You'll find yourself enabling scroll wheel just because you can, and, and certainly more interesting features than that. You'll see that this PDF, more than any for the projects, really walks you through the process of learning some of this stuff. Because we, as a course, don't really care so much if you exit knowing Google's API or anyone else's, but it's representative of a really well done API and representative of um, an API that gives you access to a really interesting data set. And their documentation is amazing. So we will walk you through various links here. For instance, the basics link walks you through some of the basic building blocks that we did a bit of tonight. So the hello world of Google Maps comes straight from their documentation. And they have even more sophisticated examples still. What you'll find ultimately most helpful as a programmer probably isn't just the tutorials, but this potentially overwhelming link here, their API reference. This is their sort of version of PHP.net or Javadoc where they document all of the classes, so to speak, that their JavaScript library has so that if you're a little curious about um, set center, how does that actually work? So set center, let me go ahead and scroll down to that particular, let me scroll down to that function, set center, here it is. So set center is that function that apparently takes, it looks like at least one required argument, a center, which is of type glat long. Apparently this question mark means the zoom level is optional, so you don't have to specify after the comma the zoom level. And then you can specify the type of map that you want to uh, have centered at the same time. So again, the specifics aren't of, of great interest right now, but just knowing where this material is will hopefully prove useful. Yeah. Yes, um, there is, so yes, so in this case, find latitude, longitude. So to be honest, there's many tools since people like to um, make mashups just for this purpose. So Google will show you, oh, actually, this is actually a cool little trick. So this is, here's one trick. So for instance, if you pull up maps.google.com and you pull up something like 90210 and you realize, oh, this is a really nice place on the map, I would like to know this. One trick is you can paste literally some JavaScript code into your browser and it will figure it out for you. There are more sophisticated approaches still that don't require that you do so much pasting in that will just tell you various locations. And yes, the PDF itself, the printout tonight, actually has a URL to a site that shows you um, how to find latitudes and longitudes a little more easily. But there's hundreds of ways out there. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Was that um, YUI code? Or? No, that was pure JavaScript DOM code that comes with JavaScript. Has no, it's none of the code I used tonight had any libraries other than Google's own. And the code you're referring to, the DOM manipulation code, is just raw JavaScript code. Other questions? So it's fun times. We love this project, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>